Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Happy Friday. My name is Vince Edivan. I am the Director of Member Relations with the Automotive Recyclers Association, and I want to welcome you to our third installment of our virtual facility tour. And uh, today we'll be going through the second part of Wilbert's, uh, of the processing, the vehicle processing for Wilbert You Pull It in Williamson, New York. And I want to welcome uh, on with me, Eric Wilbert, president of Wilbert You Pull It, and Jonathan Morrow, past president of ARA. So how you doing guys? Happy Friday. How's it going? <laughs> Very good, very good. Yeah. So, it's nice um, here, man. And I tell you what, in Virginia right now, it's like 80 degrees. So it is. I cannot wait to leave. It's <laughs> it it very, very windy, but it's beautiful <laughs> outside. <clears throat> but people didn't show up for a weather report. They want to see this. Right. Uh, they they want to see this piece that we did. And I think you guys are going to love it. If you're watching, uh, we've got about an 11 minute video that we're going to show you that we put together going through the second part of uh, the processing department in Wilbert, you call it, in Williamson, New York. And so uh, we're, we're very excited about it. We had a lot of great questions, um, a lot of great interaction with everybody. If you didn't see the first couple segments, you can catch them on our Facebook page or our YouTube channel. And if you have any comments while you're watching these videos, just, uh, just plug them into the comment section and we will, we're going to come back, Eric and Jonathan and I are going to come back on after this video and we're going to answer questions and talk about it. So um, without any further delay, we're going to go ahead and start the video. So you got two of your piece of equipment right here. Yep. But I did have a question. We were inside, you saw all the great stuff you guys were doing with fluid evacuation, but you didn't didn't touch on gas, which I know is a hot topic with everybody, you know? Oh yeah. So, yeah. so what do we do with the gas? So gas is the last thing we touch on our vehicles uh, after they've been processed and drained environmentally uh, friendly inside. So we're pulling them outside and immediately after they come out of processing, they're brought onto the gas punch rack. Yeah. And it, uh, same same company, SRS, uh, out of New York. Uh, gas punch rack here uh, has a uh, fluid containment in it for anything that spills, but it's a hydraulic cylinder with a brass uh, tip on the top of it. The funnel, there you go, there's the brass tip. Oh, look at that. So okay. that goes up, uh, punctures a hole. We're punching minimum two holes in every tank. Two holes in every tank, okay. Yep and then uh, just gravity fed over to our uh, sediment tank and then a pneumatic pump pumps it into our uh, 2000 gallon tank behind us nice so, yeah. how many how many punches can you get on that you think uh quite a few i mean okay. thousands so, so, so we can sharpen you take it off Easy. sharpen it up so but uh yeah it, most commonly a loader operator uh you're you need some point to fail the tips we have them in stock and then the funnel as well uh, it needs to slide on the cylinder, so. So you're you're, you're de you're degassing 30 cars a day. Yep. And uh, what do you do with the gas? Uh, the gas. I mean, there's your outlets to. So time out. Time out. There's one thing about this is weird though. I've seen a lot of systems that do the good gas, good gas, bad gas. Yep. And you don't have that option, on this, do you? Correct. We don't. Uh, to be honest, I just I don't see the bad gas. Yes, we get those old vehicles sitting in the hay lot, whatever. Yeah. But uh, it's very far a few between. So it's all treated as good gas for us. So it's run in management vehicles. Uh, I can tell you I've got tens of thousands of miles on our <laughs> gas, obviously. But uh, and then uh, we are uh, selling it in bulk as well if we need to uh, release some, some heavy. Sorry to catch you off. I just think no, 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 gas no, no. me yet. Yeah. We're going out here to check out, I think, the coolest part of your facility. I would say usually it's the focal point of any tour, yes. <laughs> so. It's the fact that you have a dinosaur that rips apart cars. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So. so you got this is an, this is your second your second Kabelco? Yeah, uh, we have or your a, second auto dismantler, or, you know, a 135, which is down at our other uh, self service location. This is a 210 uh, that uh, obviously a little bit bigger, a little more powerful, built designed for the American market with the uh, larger vehicles. So trucks, SUVs, that kind of things. Yep, exactly. So what I would say is, if you're a self service facility and you do not have uh, a way to extract engine transmission, 
um, in the wiring at the end of life, and you're missing out on a lot of money you're leaving on the table. And so, what do you think you can produce extra with uh, with some, a machine like this? Um, I say we'll ballpark it at a hundred dollars. Hundred dollars a car? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Okay. I know I'm letting out the secrets at you know, all the <laughs> all the secrets you got out, but but I think it's important just to uh, to realize how much money these things will make you. It, the, the machine costs a lot. Yes. But in the end, it's going to make its money back for you if you use it correctly. Correct. What do you have underneath the nibbler when it starts operating? Is there, it's got cement underneath there? Yeah. So and above cement something? There's cement and then there's a half inch steel plate uh, over almost the entire area. And that's critical because if you didn't have that, you would just have Oh, one. you'll go right through the cement probably right in cement. a year's time, depending on how much you're producing. So, so would you say that when you're using a machine like this, it's imperative to have steel plate underneath you? Yes. How for big sure. steel plate? Half inch? Uh, uh, I would say half inch, yes. Okay. Uh, you could maybe go a uh, hair less, but uh, half inch. And you want it mainly where the jaw, where that car is being torn apart. So sure. the constant, the, you know, the rotors and just the, the wear and tear on it uh, is, is uh, extensive. Yeah. So. so, so guys, listen, if you're going to go with a piece of machine like that, not only are you needing to put it in some sort of area so you can keep the rain off of this, uh, off of the area you're depolluting the, or taking the car at the end of end of life apart. Make sure you get some steel plate, half inch, maybe three quarters inch, something like that, uh, to protect the cement. Because if you just have it on cement, you're gonna, like you said, you're going to pulverize it. Yeah, it's yeah. just going to be gone uh, so so quickly. Here and in processing uh, the drain shop, every Friday we shut down early just to clean. Uh, so Monday is a fresh start, and obviously that uh, decreases production. However, mm. we're willing to uh, to take, take that, that production yep. away to clean. So this is that's that's one other thing. We know this industry can be messy. Uh, it's just what we do. And, but are we taking time to be clean? And being clean costs money. But in the end, it creates efficiencies. Would you agree? Uh, for sure. For Absolutely. sure. So so what is this real quick? I, I think this is interesting. Is this just part of a car? Or is this just no, that is a uh, custom made tool okay. uh, for the nibbler that uh, he can grab onto. And so this he grabs is his it cleaning like tool. It. Yep. And grabs like it. Yeah. Like so he's grabbing it long ways? Like, yeah, long ways. He comes over like this and he can uh, you know manipulate it. It's kind of like a squeegee basically. Yeah, he's like he's like literally cleaning off his his, his plate. Yep. If yep, you will. Exactly. And puts it into so. a spot. So I just thought that was neat. What a neat little uh, design you had this fabricated, I'm guessing, right? Of course, yep. Yeah. Uh, we keep our fabricator busy. So this fabricator designed this, but I think he designed something over here, it looks like too. Yeah. That was kind of a neat uh, neat setup for this for this um, process. Yeah, so this is a uh, turntable, we'll say, uh, that as the operator is using the machine, the cores that aren't clean uh -huh. come over here. Uh, and as it's full or the uh, employee is ready, they can rotate it and then work safely behind the uh, screen there to uh, clean up the cores and then put them in the appropriate bins. So you take this, you kind of smooth this like this? Yep. And then it can spin? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So just got to release it a little. Oh, there we go. Well, hold on. There we go. Well, whatever. You move that, you do that, it spins. I get it. <laughs> yes. And obviously, it's, I don't use it often enough to, uh, no, no, to no, do it well. So. But uh, so here, you're, the nibbler is going to take apart you know, any re remaining pre cats that were hard to get off, any steel, number one steel, any engine transmissions, wiring, set in the small components like we have here, AC, a small mechanical for cores. Yeah. And yeah. it gets separated out. Correct. And then the product gets moved this way. And yep. you've got this, this this piece of machinery, I'm sure was, you know, maybe a thousand dollars. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the, the cube, right? The baler. Yes, the baler. And the baler is going to grab the product, put it into the baler, and then just... Yep, condense it, three condense axes it. instead of one. So uh, we've had a crusher for quite a while. The baler is uh, relatively new, a few, uh, yeah, a few months old. So we're still uh, learning the operation. It's obviously changed things drastically for us. Uh, trucking as well, sure. and uh, but obstacles to overcome are, are fun. So, but you would definitely recommend two things. You'd recommend if you're going to have a nibbler to try to invest in a baler. Uh, yes. Uh, making weight on trucks, depending on where you are, uh, with uh, weight. But we can typically haul either 102 or 107,000 pound, uh, depending on the, the axles under the truck. Mm. So uh, it's it's very tough to make weight with uh, just crushed cars. So, but when you start bailing them, cubing them, uh, it's much easier. That's so. neat. Something over here was interesting, and I think it's a thing that we deal with so often in our industry is we handling the core motors. Mm -hmm. We're handling things that we've tried our best to get every bit of oil out, but yeah. there's always the crevices and the caverns, right? Yep. This spray foam. Oh yeah, 
yeah. it probably keeps it from leaking out when they're pulling it up, right? Yeah, it, it does a pretty good job. So every empty container that's dropped here, uh, we open it up, put speed to dry inside of it, and then seal up uh, all three edges. So you do this on every one that comes in? Every single one, yes. So you got the speed dry collecting all the stuff at the bottom, and then you do this to keep it from when they, because they got to pick it up, they gotta, they're going to tilt it, right? Exactly, yep. And so yep. How, how quickly will you fill one of these up? Um, hopefully one a day. One a day, okay, so, so. it's 30 units a uh, yeah, a, a little over. So obviously, you, when, as you're cleaning the yard, you come up with drive train as well. It up, yep. So, but uh, pretty close. That's great, man. And uh, it looks like you have two bins here. Are we separate? We're not separate. Are we separating the uh, aluminum blocks, steel blocks, or is it just kind of all going to one location and they're going to divvy it out for you there? Uh, all to one location, they divvy out for us. Okay. Okay. That's great. So, so you've got one, two, three. So you've got three big sections. You've got your, your drive, drive line, which would include like your transfer cases I see in there and some carrier units. Yep. You've got your wire, and then you've got your small mechanical. Yes. And, uh, and obviously any pre-cats are going off too. But yep. the rest of it is just kind of, you just, you're just getting the car ready to exactly. make sure yeah. there's nothing left so. on it that's got some money worthwhile. Yeah. Well. There's uh, aluminum as well, radiators, condensers, heater yeah, cores, that, yeah. uh, that stuff as well. We're bailing uh, dirty, we're not cleaning it at this point. Uh, then there's some other items as well that we're after um, besides small mechanical. Does, a, does the wiring go, in a, go into a roll-off or are we putting it in boxes? Uh, we actually just use uh, large vans to hold them and then uh, we're shipping in uh, um, overseas containers. Okay, containers. gotcha. So, so sea yeah. containers. That's great, man. Well, the building's awesome. It looks like it's, uh, it's, it's, it's important, I'm sure. Do we have, um, obviously the rain's kept off unless it's coming in on the side, yep. side wind, a side wind come, the side wind is coming in with the rain. Fluid, is it, is it all kept in here? Yes, yes. Okay. Try to maintain it in here. So there's uh, plans to expand the building, almost, uh, well, double it in size, uh, just to, uh, we'll say, allow for growth and uh, additional product from our full service locations to come down here as well. Just oh, to be nice. Bailed. So. Yeah, so anything that's full service that the carcass is done, it brings out here and you consolidate all of your uh, yep, yep. scrap into one location. Correct. Makes so. sense. That makes total sense. Mm -hmm. This is great, man. It's awesome. You, so you have two or three people that are dedicated in this, this part of the facility? Yeah, so two operators and then there's always, uh, most always, uh, one person handling, cleaning the uh, cores and commodities produced. That's all. That's great. Wow. This is definitely, uh, definitely a great looking site, man. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for coming. Yeah, I appreciate it. All right. Well, um, I hope you guys enjoyed that uh, that video. And we again want to give a special thank you to Superior Recycling Solutions for sponsoring uh, the last episode, the last segment, and this segment. Um, uh, uh, we got to see in the first segment. We've got to see their uh, fluid depollution system, and then in this in this segment, you saw at the beginning their uh, fuel depollution system. So, um, Eric, if you could, would you talk a little bit about the uh, the SRS fuel depollution system? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, I know he's got, I think, two different uh, types. What we have, obviously, is for the, the self-service uh, model, but uh, it, it's a rudimentary practice, basically. Um, a hydraulic cylinder with a motor pump uh, driving it, which if the uh, proximity of that, you could plumb the hydraulic system into the main power unit for the lift as well, just to consolidate. But um, it, it's a uh, Pretty simple, the uh, cylinder with the brass tip on it, punching the hole in the fuel tank and uh, uh, chaining it down. I don't think we really talked about that uh, with plastic tanks and just for safety, uh, keeping the vehicle on that lift. Uh, there are two chains on each end of each end. John has got his technical difficulties. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> sorry, but... Uh, yeah, so you can put the vehicle on either uh, direction, just the way it comes out of the processing lift. And uh, from there, transfers down. We didn't address the uh, fluid capturing. It's just a gravity fed, similar uh, process to the fluid separator that separates out the sediment and then uh, pumped from there into your holding tank. So uh, with the, the vehicles, in the salt belt where we are, uh, every punch, I mean, if there's a, a shock in the vehicle, 
that funnel is capturing a little bit of rust. And uh, that's probably the, the biggest nuisance, we'll say the rust, the sand that you collect, may, uh, you know, requires a little bit of maintenance here and there. So. Yeah. So uh, I know we mentioned, there's a couple of things I want to mention today that I know we covered last week, but just in case uh, somebody hasn't seen that segment, the same person that uh, depollutes the vehicle inside, all the oils and everything, they 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 walk. It's not far. I don't know if you if we showed it in this video, but it might be 20, 30 yards. They walk from that point when the uh, loader moves it over to the fuel. It's the same person, right? Correct. Yep. The same person follows that vehicle. Um, the, the situation that arises most commonly is uh, a shield on the gas tank. And uh, for safety reasons, we're not uh, removing the entire shield. So they are aware, uh, most likely where that vehicle is going to be punched and where they've, you know, put a, a cut in that shield to safely punch it. So, uh, we have them follow it, uh, right. Basically, you know, cradle to grave in theory, but on the, the U bullet side of things. So, and, and explain to us why you depollute the, why you remove the fuel after you do the rest of the, the depolluting. Yeah, so that is um, the last, I mean, mainly just due to fumes or vapors. Uh, obviously, we're, we're, well, not obviously, but uh, after we punch those vehicles, uh, one thing I learned while touring a, another yard, Gary, as you pull it down in Binghamton, Steve Barkle has been a tremendous asset to us. And uh, I think Jono's family is uh, using his uh, knowledge as well. But um, we were down there touring and we saw after they punched it, they went in with the loader fork, tipped the vehicle, depending on where they punch the fuel tank, either they tip the front up or back just to capture a little bit more of the residual fuel in these tanks as uh, they're becoming a little bit more unique to fit underneath the vehicles. So um, we try to capture all of it, but you're not going to get all, you, know, you might get all the liquid. However, there's still going to be some vapors left. And just for safety, uh, we do not want anything. And to, to hit on that point as well, if we buy a vehicle, and it comes into processing and we detect any fuel leak whatsoever, if it's the tank uh, rotten at the seams or a fuel line, that vehicle is immediately pulled out um, immediately and put on the gas punch and then put to the side for a little while until it's processed. So when I, a little while, probably a few days uh, until it's brought back inside just to ensure there's no fumes. Gotcha. So if you're if you're watching and you have any questions about what we're talking about, please just chime in. Uh, put your put your questions in the comment section there, and we'll address them. Uh, Jono, Jonathan, I think you had a couple questions. Yes, I did, and uh, my, I, you know, I hope that uh, I, I got to ask so many questions during the tour, but this was probably my favorite part because I, I really do enjoy watching that auto dismantler just rip the cars apart. So Eric, you said you had three people in that, in that, in that portion, correct? You have the guy, the person running the, uh, auto dismantler, the person that's running the, 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 the baler machine or feeding the baler. Yep. Yeah, and so then the you have a plans. helper. Exactly. Yeah. We've got a, a labor sorting through the uh, commodities that are generated, uh, from the, the nibbler. Do, do you do you feel that that's the maximum? Uh, that that's where you've been. If if you add an extra person, it's is is it more people would help the process or to get in the way, or is that just the optimal number of people you feel like you would need? You need there um, for the thirty cars a day, and depending on what you're recovering, uh, it, it suits us very well. As soon as you start pumping up your numbers, um, you, you could or, or uh, subtracting, we'll say a little bit, the operator can jump out. I know there's times where the operator, depending on what they're recovering, uh, is definitely not, you know, uh, per, you know, doesn't have work for all day. So they could easily get out. And I would say the most time consuming uh, product that we have is the harness wire, ensuring that it is clean. So, mm -hmm. rule of so thumb, what, what, do you, what do you mean by clean? Like let's, when you say clean wire, Yep. What's that? Uh, clean wire, no solid pieces of steel. Uh, and then anything, a connector or fuse box that is larger than your fist is our rule of thumb has to be removed. Mm -hmm. So 
lot of that though, large fuse boxes, ECMs, uh, we're sorting those separately anyways. And, uh, but it, it's, um, a very time consuming. And if you can moderate how much you're giving to that person to clean at a time, it goes a lot faster. So we've learned a, a few things to assist the process along the way. Sure. And, and, and as I'm, I'm watching this and seeing that there's different people who have uh, machines that dismantle the cars like you do, you happen to have the Cabelco 210 with the auto dismantler set up on it, obviously. What do you feel? Do you let everybody use that machine or how do you do that? I mean, let me everybody, use I mean, like, like, so, so with a loader, you know, there may be more than one person that can operate the loader at certain facilities, but with that piece of equipment, how do you manage it at Wilbert's? Because I think as it, as it becomes more normalized in the industry, I, I just, what do you guys do as your rule of thumb when you have this piece of equipment? Um, the first rule is don't let management in it. So we, we look <laughs> That. Sorry for that if you're listening, but uh, I, I think I maybe have about five minutes of seat time in that thing. So uh, to be honest, it's, it's a specialized tool, uh, you know, loaders, forklifts, not to discredit the operators of those, but this auto dismantler, uh, th there's a lot of more buttons and uh, situations that you can get yourself in trouble and cause harm to a, a very expensive piece of equipment. Um, so we have one full-time operator who has been uh, phenomenal. He was in the 135 when it was on site here, which is now down at our other self-service location. And, uh, we do have a, we'll say part-time fill-in when he's on vacation or, or not, uh, in for the day. So, uh, mainly two people. And I, I think that's, at least from my knowledge, common practice with these dismantlers, just because they're such a specialized tool. Um, sure. But Eric, we have a question from Facebook. Uh, Jesse wanted to know why you went with a baler instead of a crusher. Yeah, so uh, Jesse, good question. We've uh, we ran an overbuilt crusher, an electric crusher, uh, for quite a few years, little probably about six years, and it served us very well, uh, just with our situation and uh, what we're able to haul um, weight wise. The baler uh, is a pretty easy decision just to, we'll say, potentially overload the trucks that are coming in. So uh, it, it's condensing the material quite a bit more. The auto dismantler uh, creates a mess, not to say you can't clean it up with a crusher, uh, but with our, we'll say, uh, ability and strive to be as clean as possible, the baler aids in that. and. The other thing we touched on on the end is that our full service locations, a lot of their uh, end of life product does end up at our facility now, which the baler enabled and uh, streamlined some of our other facilities that are close by. So, I mean, at the end of the day, a big part of the answer is when you're loading, when you're loading a truck to go out, you run out of weight before you run out of space. Mm -hmm. And the baler enables that to happen rather than the other way around. Exactly. Yeah. It, it's a pretty big swing going from crush cars to bales um, and load time, uh, safety. So it, it's a lot. There's a lot of, uh, we'll say, uh, points you have to analyze because mm -hmm. it's a huge step up. I mean, it's, it's almost triple the cost of um, going from crusher to baler, actually over. So, um, so Eric, when we were walking through your processing, your deep polluting uh, center, um, you'd mentioned that there are catalytic converters you can't always get, or the time involved to get them at you know that process. They go, they get spray painted, right, and then they go to the yep. yard. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that obviously at this point in the process, the end of end of life, the Cobelco, the auto dismantler is looking for those. You know, if they pull the engine out, they see one on there, they're going to pull it off and they're going to put it on that protective uh, swivel tray we saw, right? That I tried to move the chain on and so it can get yes. sorted out. How many, on average, how many cats are with, with it, are you seeing per car right now? If, if, you know, just because it's such a big thing for us and I feel like in the you pull it area, there's that tension between do I put all the effort in on the front end and if you have the auto dismantler on the back end, is, you know, how many are you seeing if that makes sense now? And are you, you're making sure you get them all off at the end of life at the Cabelco, but yeah, so two questions, I guess. 
Yeah, um, I, I guess I would give you the averages that we're striving for uh, recovery on the three different phases. Uh, the per car, uh, I, I guess I, I have the averages. So roughly what we're striving for is 85% recovery uh, inside processing. That number fluctuates obviously uh, with our output that we want, you know, our per car number per day. Mm -hmm. So right now we're running uh, in this, the Williamson location, quite a backlog. So we're, we're starting to increase our production numbers and that 85%, you know, might suffer a little. Then from there, I would say 10% is what we're trying to recover in the yard. Um, a lot of these back cats, V6 front wheel drive cars uh, are, are very difficult to get out. We will pull the front end of a vehicle apart just to get that front cat or a lot of times the customers will do it for us. <laughs> and, um, and then about 5% of recovery roughly from the, the dismantler. So he's um, a, a, your operator on that machine is everything. His, we grade each converter, the condition, recovery and uh each vehicle is identified as well with uh how many are converters are in that vehicle so he's knowledgeable when he's going to harvest that drivetrain out of the motor you know what he needs to be careful for but a lot of it, it i mean it's repetition you're doing you know 30 30 plus a day you learn the inventory very quickly uh what's sure. to be expected so um but i would say five percent um and you're, you're at you know, 1.6, a little bit above that right now per car converters. So. And so 1.6 is kind of the other number that w when you say you, your guys have a feel for how many cats are on a car, that's what you think you, the number is right now is about 1.6. Yeah. It's, um, it, it's been hovering around there. Uh, we're getting a little bit better. Well, a lot better as we alluded to in the, uh, uh last week, how we've changed our process and a uh, change uh, that we've already implemented since uh, that video just uh, aired. We're separating our aluminum from our cast motors uh, mm -hmm. finally, so which is has been a good good change. So, um, but uh, yeah, that that number is hovering right around there. So that's good. That's good. Hope to get them back uh, in your piggy bank, working for you as quickly as possible. So that's right. Yeah, and I, and I just 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 to make it for the record, anybody watching, I was really thinking that Eric was going to let me drive that auto dismantler until I realized he doesn't even do it. So a little bit I, of still it's all hope. yours. I still had hope that he was going to let me do it. <laughs> uh, you guys are both more than welcome to trust me. I think the family would allow you over me. So yeah, <laughs> he's gone. <laughs> Uh, well, one thing, one thing that also came up is that for those of us in this industry who are getting these sort of excavator things, excavator uh, machines, they can be so dangerous when you're dismantling. You have people walking around. I mean, I think that was something that we talked about. Just what safety procedures do you guys use while, while, while you're operating around the, uh, the auto dismantler and around the baler? What do you tell the people this is a this is what you have to do this is how you have to operate or, or be cognizant of <clears throat> yeah i mean it starts with the operator um obviously uh turning being aware of surroundings uh communication uh, all of our locations we use two-way radios and um any time approaching even the baler as well uh or, or even a crusher you know shrapnel um can come flying out of those things so uh, identifying your location, you know, where you are in proximity to him uh, or her uh, that that's operating that piece of equipment. So, and then um, we, with that turntable, we did have some caging around it. And then either that workstation or the other uh, primary workstation would be where they're, we're cleaning the uh, copper, there's caging around it as well. So, but it's probably about 30 to 40 feet, we'd say, away from the vehicle, which is, uh, mm. we'll say hard safe hats. distance. Hard hats, hard safety hats, glasses. Cut sleeves and safety toe. Mm. Good. That's good to know. Nope. So. Well, good. Uh, John, Jonathan, do you have any more questions? You know, I, I think that, I, I think it's, it, here's a question that I don't know if you know the answer to. Uh, you probably do, but. When you're doing the end of life vehicles, um, what you, do you have a do you have like a value you want to put on each car that the auto dismantler has to try to achieve? Like how much 
how about this? More specific. How much wire do you expect to get out of a car on average with the auto dismantler? Pound wire. Yeah, that's a, a common question. Uh, the low low twenties. Once the harness wire is cleaned, so we're weighing it every single day. Uh, what we recover, and then obviously divided all the vehicles. So um, it, it's a it's a pretty good recovery rate, uh, depending on the operator as well and how in tune they are with each vehicle, knowing how to attack each vehicle also dictates what that vehicle will yield. So yeah. uh, it's not just, um, you know, go after this, that, you know, the, the approach and uh, the priority level for each commodity uh, changes how you attack certain vehicles. So um, yeah, which any good operator could attest to, but John, the, the, the dollar amount, uh, I mean, I'm thinking about just uh, aluminum and cast, our d figures have doubled, as I'm sure everyone across the nation has seen commodity markets just skyrocket. And it's um, it's great to see, don't get me wrong, but it, it changes the game uh, tremendously um, for purchasing and then for recovery rates. And uh, on the positive side, it, it changes things that, you know, maybe you, you weren't going after previously, but mm -hmm. now there is a market for that uh, you do want to try to recover. So um, it, it's a, I, I enjoy the commodity market tremendously as uh, we grew up in the full service world and it's uh, it's all core value. However, in the, the self-service model, there, there's a lot on the, the scrap core value, we'll call sure. it, so. Um, That's yeah. good, that's good, thank you. Yeah, well, um, good, good stuff. And uh, I appreciate everybody that's watching. Jesse, appreciate your question. Uh, Jonathan, you did a great job asking the right questions and, and Eric, I always appreciate your expertise on the matter. Um, so we are going to, we're going to close this out and, uh, wish everybody a happy Friday and, and, uh, we will see you next week. So don't forget to tune in next week for our final segment. We're going to be, uh, we're going to take a look at the entire retail portion of Eric's place. We're, and uh, it's going to be really cool. You don't want to miss it. Um, we're going to we're going to look at just his retail area, just the way they set it up. And, and I mean, it looks looks amazing. It's like it's uh, it's almost like walking into a, an advanced auto parts. It's very clean and organized. And then we're going to go out to the yard and see the way they lay out the yard and how they lay out the cars. Uh, Eric, you, you guys just don't throw the cars out there, do you? And uh, no, no, <laughs> it sounds like they might be getting thrown around right now at the wind, but uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Re -arrange it come on exactly how many inches apart every car is. I'll, I'll just give you a teaser on that. Um, so anyway, uh, thank you guys for joining us, and thank you everybody for, for watching, and we will see you next week.